We really need to work on that. Is, is there no way you can... I know what the solution is, that it's to uh, just mute you when we first start, but I like that. I like how our show starts now with the robotic lady telling us that we're doing it. <laughs> it's a sweet Yeah, thoughts, I'll get my way. timing I'm down t- a little bit more. No, it's fine. Uh, that's Tim. I'm Howard. Tim O'Connor, of course, a mental performance coach, uh, Guelph Griffins, um, O'ConnorGolf.ca, webinars, leadership training, obedience training for your mind, that kind of thing. And uh, and me, I'm just a simple uh, spiritual leader. I'm just, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm just a quiet, simple, you know, spiritual guide when it comes I know, you're to like golf. A, you're, you've really become like a, a golf monk. You know, you like sleep when tired, eat yeah. when hungry, uh, hit flop shots when required. Otherwise, get it rolling on the green as fast as you can. Yeah, I'll tell you. Uh, I was talking to our friend Charles Fitzsimmons last last night, who I actually spent time with this week. Um, and we were talking on another matter, and he said, well, how was the round today? I said, you know what, Charles? My streak of leaving the golf course without wanting to punch myself in the face is intact. <laughs> you see, That's you how I measure well, that's yes. how I measure around now. I do. Um, and I had an... Listen, you know, GSL wants you all to know, <clears throat> excuse me, that I still get... Individual shots can still piss me off. You know, yesterday I was 155 out, 17th hole. You know, I don't even... I don't know where I was in the round. I was a few over par. It didn't really matter. It wasn't like having an extraordinary day or not, but I... I it was the kind of shot where, you know, I expected a certain outcome, and I kind of wipeed it. I wiped it right. I wipeed it. Nope. I wipeed it. You know, I get a little <laughs> bit of a wave. I, I was going to say wavy. It was kind of a wavy wipe to the right. Yeah. And then even though, even though decade-wise, it wasn't a ter- I, I ended up pin high in a bunker uh, 50 feet from the flag. So not terrible. Um, and I didn't care about being in the bunker, but it was just the kind of shot where I was trying to hit a draw. I forgot to hit the draw and I wiped it right and I slammed my club down. But in such a non visceral way, I'm not, do you know what I mean? Like it didn't live inside me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you, you thank you for confirming your humanity Yeah. that G, you're still GSL. You're, you are ascending, but you still have connection to us mere mortals. So I'm, well, this, this gives noticing. me hope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as I said to Chuck, I said, yeah, I, I slammed the club down because it was, it was just, I was, you know what bothered me? Not that I made a bad swing or I hit a bad shot or whatever. What bothered me, and this is takeaway number one today, is I made a swing that was not committed. You know, sometimes... When you're in between shots, like I always seem to err on the, let's take more club. When I was talking to my buddy Henrik after the round, I described the shot to him. He said, well, I know what your mistake was. I said, what? He said, you took too much club. I'm like, really? He said, well, listen, Howard, it's 155 downwind. And instead of making an aggressive swing to a conservative target, you made a wimpy, wavy swing to a vague target. And that's what pissed me off. As I knew in the moment, that I didn't commit to that. Because if you're going to take more club, you've still got to make a golf swing. And I think for a lot of us, this is a technical thing. If you're taking more club, one of the things that you should remind yourself is you need to make an aggressive swing with that club. If it goes far, fine. But I didn't. I, that's what, and it's funny. I I think also, I don't mean to be too esoteric as well, but my ascension is that I've learned the difference. I wasn't mad that the shot went bad because they do. All the time. And I was angry with myself for not committing to it. Yeah, and okay to get mad. I mean, yeah. you know, you are bordering on enlightenment, but you're just I was like, not I say psychotic. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought psychotic was going to be the next thing after that. Um, Timothy, you know what I think we should do? Talk about sponsors and stuff? Yes, we should. I thought I'd throw in a little... Uh, Little talking heads. How about uh, how good do you look in your Jonathan Wong apparel ink uh, yes, polo this morning? Yes, my fairway green houndstooth. Yeah. I love this. I, I'm not sure on Zoom whether it's doing a, a psychedelic thing that's going to make people have an acid flashback, but I'm digging it, man. Uh, I'm wearing. Uh, I think this is zero restriction. 
I know. Why am I wearing a long sleeve uh, shirt? Because uh, I'm in the studio portion of my house, which is so cold right now. JWApparelInc.com. Fairway and Green, Zero Restriction, B Dratty, EPNY, Garb, Royal Albatross, and PRG Golf are some of the brands that Jonathan Wong uh, represents. And as you can see, looking good, my friends. And of course, TaylorMade Golf. Um, I got the uh, Sim Driver, Sim 2 Driver. And I was hanging out with our friend Casey, and he said, "I don't. I think you can uh, turn this down a little bit because I was launching it really high." Oh yeah. And um, I brought my uh, flight down a bit, but I can tell you, with the hybrid, with the three wood, and this driver, it's it's bananas. It really is. Yeah, I've been having some fun too. Uh, last Sunday's round, um, I'd never been as far as I was on. Two holes on 15 and 16 at Blue Springs. Like, holy cow. That's some fun stuff. It is for fun. For an older person. <laughs> uh, well, that's the thing is like, you know, you, you just hope that, you know, I, I mean, we both work out. We try and stay in shape. And all you're doing, and TaylorMade is helping, is to kind of keep some sort of the status quo. But I will say there are, a couple of times the last week or so, I've had a few drives. I was like, I don't think that old people are supposed to hit it that far. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point. <laughs> uh, so uh, whether it's getting a fitting or whether it's the golf ball you want to change to, the TP5, I'm using the pick ball. Uh, I find it interesting. It, it has this oh, cool yeah. thing on the greens. You can kind of see it roll end over end. And, of course, the drivers and Sim 2 irons, all of the information you're looking for is at tailormadegolf.ca. Um, I'm trying to find the email you sent me. Regarding? Regarding today's subject. Which is? Uh, the, your round, <laughs> your round of, del, of, of, I was going to, not delusion, uh, disillusion. Your round yeah. of, your round yeah. of well, sorrow. My round of sorrow, yes. Misery and woe. Um, yeah, last Thursday, you, I, what, what, what would that hold? But let me, let me have it for references. I want to set it up to the audience. Do, do you, do you remember what the subject matter was? Um, uh, despair, um, <laughs> Tim O'Connor. No, what was the subject? Hide, hide sharp objects. Um, and I'm still getting some of the, uh, my audio coming back from your computer. So, all right. Keep, I'll turn keep aware you of that. down. I don't know. Did I send you an email or did we uh, just commiserate on the no, phone? No, 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 no. You sent me a note and, um, oh, here it is. No, no, that was the note I sent you about what, the guy that said I was a nice person to play with. And, yeah, well, that's just, that's no surprise. No, well, it you, was a surprise. No, it would have been a surprise three or four years ago, but uh, if you can find the note. Anyway... I got this note from Tim, and uh, it looking. was a note. It should have been subject, uh, why does golf hate me? Why, <laughs> why, why can't it ever? And the reason I think it's important is because, you know, you know, you joke about it, you know, my ascension to spiritual, you know, nirvana, but you're a mental performance coach, and uh, you deal with people's golf anxieties for a living, and now you've, are you still there? Yeah, I'm just, I was just looking through it. Oh, okay, because I thought you froze for a second. You had the Zoom frozen face on. No, that's my, that's my, <laughs> you know, that, 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 what do they call that? That's, that's my focus face. You, you know, have resting, you see, that was your resting focus face. Yeah, when you see someone like driving down the highway, and says, I've never seen George look like that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't find it. Anyways. Oh, that's ridiculous. Like, I got a million emails from you. It doesn't matter, I guess. Yeah. Well, I can just spell matter. it out what happened. How about yeah, that? okay. I just thought it was interesting because I get this email from Tim describing a round of golf. And, and it would be like an email you would have gotten from, gotten from a, a typical golfer who is frustrated with a recent round. Maybe you can then, you know, take us through your journey. Yeah, well, it was, um, 
It was opening of Men's Night. It was a so a week ago, Men's Night at Blue Springs. So looking forward to it. And um, anyways, um, started off pretty well. I don't know what it, you know, some pars and some bogeys. It's pretty nice, pretty nice golf. And then um, I started to get this recurring pain that I get in my left thigh. It's actually my ET, my IT band, I think they call mm-hmm. it. Yeah, and I've been working with uh, Brooke Benny Bamalam to, to fix it. It's been coming along, but it was just starting to really aggravate me. And so by the 12th hole, I couldn't make a practice swing without it hurting. And anyways, just it just started golf just started to just go off the rails. And you know, the dead lefts returned. Anyways, I shot a uh, shot 90. Hmm. And and I was aware as I left the golf course that I just felt really crappy. And it was and I was aware that I was starting to spin into the thoughts of, of really you do, you coach people and you shoot 90, really you've been working on your game and you shoot 90, really, you know, all this. Uh, so I was, and I was like that disillusionment. So that is the right word, I think. And, and but way, I was just, also if I may cognizant. just interject quickly. I mean, like, because we're now recording this for video purposes, when you look back, you're going to say, why didn't Howard mention that there was a little shade? There's a little sliver of light on your yeah, chin. Yeah, I know. I don't know how to deal with it. I don't know where it is. Well, okay, um, then just let's just live with it, man. Yeah, I you don't know, know where that's like, coming from. Is it like it's like a message from uh, the heavens? <laughs> where is that coming from? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, uh, oh, there I, you go. Oh, you know what? Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Yeah, you just you just there, there you, go. you go. What was it? Yeah. No, it's your um, it's your PGR PRGR. Yeah, uh, the light monitor. was shining off my PRGR. Okay, by the way, oh, I found, we are I, golf nerds. I found the yeah, exactly, dude. I've got my yardage book here. I'm going to be inputting <laughs> some decade stats when this is over. Um, okay, so you're. By the way, I found the email. So uh, there you go. I found the email. Um, I just wanted there's some great there's some great stuff in here. You said I had a story going that I'm refusing to accept that I'm getting older, oh, damaged part, yes. damaged goods. Listen to this. This is a guy describing his golf game, not the breakdown of his life, marriage, or family. I had a a, a story that I was get damaged goods and clinging to some kind of fantasy that I can play the blues and regularly shoot 76. This is a man that does this for a living. Drove home feeling crappy, but was able to bring myself out of the funk by realizing that golf is a hard game and made more difficult when there's pain. <laughs> were you and I? Was it you and I were talking about Foley, or was that somebody else? I was having that discussion with. We were talking about Foley. Yeah, right. And how he accepts that even though he teaches Tiger Woods and the best players on the in the planet, on the planet, he goes out and shoots seventy eight. Yeah. So what? Okay, please continue, Tim, and talk to us about your golfing pain. Thank you. Are you Fraser Crane and you're listening? I'm listening. Um, <laughs> well, it, the, what I was aware of is I was thinking like, really, is this thing now, um, this injury thing, something I got to deal with now? And is it going to be part of like my golf life? And is it going to mean I'm going to have to take a cart forever? And that with this pain, I'm not going to be able to get over to my left side, you know, all that, all that type of thinking. And, um, you know, it's a, sure, it's a story. Mm -hmm. And I was neck deep in the, in the story. And that's pretty normal stuff. You know, as I said earlier, and I said to you, and I say this to, to the people all the time, Thank you for confirming your humanity because <laughs> it happens to everybody. And um, so the thing that I was aware, of, I became more aware of, and particularly the next morning, the morning after, was it's kind of like, okay, Tim, you're dealing with an injury. And I'm sure this happens to a lot of golfers and athletes. So you get something happens and, and of course, it's quite natural to say, worry about it, or, you know, is this, is this the way it's going to be now? 
and what's the ramifications of that and is that going to mean you know as i said it might damage goods now if you will and it's and i have to sort of take a different approach to my golf because i still uh, as i i consider myself a pretty good player um love to compete you know i i talk all the time about going out to play with a, a degree of uh, freedom and having fun but i'm competitive just like everybody else i want to play golf where i get the ball in the hole when i want you know not when i want to but on a regular basis if you will and shoot good scores you know i'm trying to balance well, all that all that stuff with having fun and freedom etc sure that stuff. but Talk but two it. things in particular are for, for golfers, I think, are informative, instructive, whatever you want to say. That One is the future casting. Yeah. You know, part of regular meditation practice is to bring yourself back to the moment. But remember that thing I sent you from Decade with Sam Harris talking about how we have this fantasy that nothing bad will ever happen to us. And then he goes on to list like every day, you know, some device you rely on might break down, you know, every day. You know, there's an opportunity to freak out in traffic. And every day, especially at our age, something's going to hurt. The problem with it is because we're so competitive as you think, okay, my IT band is stiff and I'm not getting the move that I want. Is this me forever? Meanwhile, you're still in this, you're still in the same day that you were occupying. You have, you have, but we're future casting to a life of driving a car. I'm probably going to have to have my hip replaced. <laughs> You know, I mean, maybe maybe I should start swinging left-handed. That'll be easier. <laughs> Which, by the way, at some point in my freaking out journey, I've considered, oh, maybe screw this, I'll just play left-handed. But all of that is to say that it's it's like every golfer. We, and it took me a long time to get this. I understood this in my regular life before I understood it in my golf life, which was when we're sick, we always think we're going to be sick forever. And then we're well, we never think about being sick. And is <laughs> exactly. if, you've, if you've had a bit of a, an illness for a couple of days, as soon as it's over, you forget all about it. Golf is like that. We have a bad round and think, oh, great. Well, this is it then. For, this is how I'll play. You know, I played with a really great guy the other day in our little Saturday morning game. And on about the uh, 11th or 12th hole, he'd been having a, not a great day, but he went at some point, he was like, well, <laughs> he said, uh, well, that's the day's over for me anyway. And I just looked at uh, the other guy in the group and I'm like, are we, aren't we, don't, aren't there six holes to go? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, the day is over for me, I guess. Yeah. But that's what we do in golf. We future project that the ability we have on that day is the ability we're going to have forever. We also do it, by the way, when things are great. We have our oh. best round or we're, we got a bunch of good things going. And we think, well, I've solved golf. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> you know, that happens to me about three times a week. I think, well, I shouldn't, don't tell anyone, but I think I've solved it. <laughs> Never do. No, of course not. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a mountain with no top. You never own golf. Yeah. You just rent it a little for a little yeah. while. It's like, uh, I was thinking of this the other day and I might've been a bit, uh, TH seed when I had this no notion that I thought golf's kind of like a, you know, we've talked about it being an, un, an unsolvable puzzle, but even a puzzle like a Rubik's cube has a certain combinations. There are infinite combinations, but there are combinations that will unlock the, the cube. But golf is like a Rubik's cube, a cube with lots of possibilities, but they're all person specific and mostly can never be solved. Imagine this game, is, is something you and I have spent so much of our lives trying to figure it out. And yet here we are, <laughs> you know, yeah. I know 168 I, podcasts in still exactly. haven't figured it out. <laughs> still don't have an answer. Well, it's, so a, it's like me. every, it's like everything else in, in, in life. It's a freaking mystery. You know, it's all, you know, we can't control any of it, you know, in many ways, it's all kind of a gift. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and trying to figure it out futile. Yeah, Ab absolutely futile. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, the reason I'm a coach uh, is because I go through everything that my clients go through. Yeah. And any coach who doesn't uh, admit to that uh, is freaking lying to you. 
Um, and that's what I loved about that uh, piece that Sean Foley put up. And that's actually about three or four years old. Yeah. Is, 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 is there's no, like, there's no ego involved in that with Foley. He goes, this is the way I am. This is what I do. I'm a coach for gosh sakes. I'm not a tour player. And anyways, it's so anyway, that's, that's part of uh, an insight into, into the coaching world, if you will. But, um, there's an interesting, uh, is corollary the right mm, word? I like that. Uh, okay. We'll go with that. So, um, Saturday. I played yet again. Yes, I was going to say there was a round following that round, just like there's always another round. There's always another day. And so I go out, and this is my first time participating in the group called Hustlers at Blue Springs. You know, one of those. Yeah, yeah, we have the same group as Glenn Karen. Yeah, you leave. They stole the name from us. I don't need, know that we need. No, to that's true that, because you guys but... used to call your Saturday morning name uh, sh- game grinders until too many men were like, "Oh, and we can't be grinders." It's a bit <laughs> of a homophobia. Yeah. Exactly. So let's be fair. You called it grinders until a bunch of guys went, "No, let's not call it that." Anyhow. Okay. Well, I'm just gonna let that go. Uh, <laughs> so this is my please first... do. It's not important. Yeah. Exactly. This is my first participation in the group Hustlers. And, um, so again, kind of a, a nice start. And then, um, the dead lefts again, you know, this has been something that, you know, we all have something. It's kind of like the, uh, the thing that Satan has, has cursed us with, you know, the miss, the miss shot that comes (laughs) He's like, I'm really, I'm really delving back into my Catholicism, aren't I? Whoa. Um, anyways, um, we all have this shot that just is like death, you know? And the, for me, the, the Uber left shot is like auto reload, you know, gone. Anyways. Especially on a course like yours, lots of trees. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So anyways, um, that happens. Actually, even though I started off really nicely and I was aware that, uh, so I didn't actually have any pain going that day. I actually started to do a new thing and take Advil before. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> I know. Played. I can't believe when we talked, I, let me just pop in here. When yeah. I talked to you after your round of sorrow, I, I was talking to you about, you know, rehab <laughs> and what I do. And you said, well, yeah, I usually take Advil after. I'm like, are you new? Every guy our age on the range is gob. I'm I'm there doing my swinging and my stretching, and these guys are just gobbling Advil and Toradol. Anyway, you took the Advil before the round. Duh! Please, continue. yeah. And, and that little uh, medical I'm tape listening. stuff. I put I put that on my on my thigh too. I was like prepared. Anyways, nice. I felt good. I didn't have any pain, but somehow the golf swing was not working right very well. And what I was finding is that you know i'd get a little bit upset and then would be like okay i'm gonna let that go i was working really hard on just being like out there particularly right. looking at the golf course and listening to my partners and we really had a lot of fun and but i was really conscious that i was looking at the golf course throughout the front nine so you know there were some times in which i was started to like dive into a bit of a story but whoa that's happening okay we can come out of that just doing a little bit of mindfulness on the golf course anyways so i make the turn in a very smooth 48 and it looks like you know part of me going to the 10th tee i'm going like whoa this is going to (laughs) be you know you were 90 last thursday good luck doing that uh this week anyways um shot 36 on the back yeah. Golf mystery, same guy. same guy. Absolutely. Well, I have two. I have two, possibly twenty things to tell you, but I'll just start with two. <clears throat> when, well, I, I would tell you something. You would tell your client. You're not your golf score. Your oh, golf really? score doesn't reflect any way accurately your ability. It just reflects what happened that day. Totally. And, you know, and it's hard. You know, listen. I'm. I, I've said this on the show a million times. That was the worst I've ever met. The worst I've ever met of, of any level of golfer 
of any level of moping and all the other stuff. So I, I, when I say this, I tell you from experience. There's another thing, and again, this again, if you're if you're drinking during this podcast, and decade is the, <laughs> I'm on my second or third decade reference. One of the things about the decade, you know, stuff that I've delved into, is what what is an actual accurate reflection of your ability? Because we all have averages, and we all have either side of our averages. So one of the things they say is, and and again, as far as the mental discipline of of having proper expectations is knowing that after shooting 48 on the front nine, your our golf games will always find their level. Another way of saying this is, and I've said it before, everyone's eventually everyone's handicap shows up. Good and bad. I've played with lots of guys, you know, with six and seven and eight handicaps that have shot even par on the front nine. And it's kind of I've been in matches with them. I'm like, ooh, you know, I'm down three. Mm. And I haven't even played that well, but I know at some point they're handicapped. There's a seven for a reason. And I would say the same thing after the turn to you, you're a six or seven for a reason. It's because you shoot, you don't shoot 48, 48. You're more likely actually that there's a, the point of this, by the way, is to, for people listening, doesn't matter what your front nine was good and bad. You've got to be aware when it's good, you've got to be aware, okay, you know, um, I'm a seven. So if I'm even par, you know, to be a seven, I'm probably have to, you know, I might shoot 42 in the back. So awareness of that might keep you more focused. But also if you have a, an outlier front nine of 48, I, I knew the end of that story was going to be under 40 because you're a good player for a reason. Now, 48, 36 is extreme. That's amazing, actually. That's very... That shows some big boy, you know, mental adjustments, especially on the back nine there, which is hard. That's not an easy nine. This first hole is ridiculous. Oh, I know. Well, every, well, Blue Springs is a, is a difficult golf course. Yeah, it's, like, it's a no difficult golf miss. course. And especially if you're missing it left. And so, an, uh, but my point again is knowing your averages and knowing what handicaps really mean you know, give your, it'll give you a little bit of a break if you don't have a good front nine this weekend. Rather than give up like the guy I was playing with who said, well, you know, my day is over now. You know, and I've said it a million times. You never know when the next hole will begin the best string of golf you've ever played. Unless you say the day is done. Then you can guarantee it won't be. Yeah, exactly. And what's interesting is that I think, um, I think my best nine last year was a 37. So there you go. 48, 36 best in a couple of years. But what's interesting and I, I love the, how our sort of the threads of our recent podcasts have come is because it's, it's brought a level of awareness of what you were talking about, the variances and how the numbers mm -hmm. and the data really sh show up. So I was really proud of myself uh, for practicing what I think was like being a mindful golfer is that being aware that things are happening to me on the front and starting to react a bit, but then going like, okay, well, let's pause a sec and, and not going down the rabbit hole, if you will. So that part I was proud of, but what I've learned from you, the uh, PhD uh, designate, <laughs> In decade, oh, no, in decade, yeah, is that how there is this, how your handicap shows up in the variances. It's kind of like in a way analytics has come Absolutely. to golf in, in, in a way and because and the kind of the numbers bear out because it's based on so much experience of other golfers and we're all you know, we're all humans, we're all golfers. And so we have these tendencies and these very smart people like Scott Fawcett have looked at this stuff with Lou and whatnot, and they, they see these tendencies yeah. and it's very interesting to see how they, they, they bear out. And I've been talking a lot with my clients about this whole thing around expectations. And well, I, I, them, I just want to pause you there because yeah, the expect sure. the, the, the line in this email that I think you need to get your head around basically what you're saying about the decade and its predictability of 
of outcomes and variances is you say I I'm clinging to some kind of fantasy that I can play the blues and regularly shoot 76. Well, but how did that sentence start? It's, it, I had a story going, I'm refusing to accept, I'm getting, oh, yeah, go. yeah, that was your story. Yeah. But, but in reality, I, mm-hmm. you know, I think your, your index is like 6.7 or something. Yeah. Okay. So that doesn't, that's not regularly shooting 76. I hate to tell you, that's regularly shooting around 78 or 79, occasionally right. 76, and sometimes 83. So right away, if, you're, if your idea, as you say, your fantasy, or clinging to a fantasy, it's, it's not that you shouldn't be aspirational. You, can shoot se- you could shoot 76 every day you played. It's not without possibility, but you have to look realistically, what is it you actually shoot? You know, and... and it's sometimes I think with golfers myself was again, the worst ever is that we have a unrealistic vision of ourselves. We all think we're better than we really are. And we all think we should be doing better than we really are based on almost nothing. Like you said to me a few minutes ago, you know, you're competitive and I know you are, you're a competitive person, but your competitive experience doesn't really match the reality. Do you know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. You, Again, it's, 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 you're not unusual. A lot of us have this fantasy of that. We, you know, that we're like, I love that golf galaxy inside of every golfer, you know, lies a better one or so we think. And I think it's when we can kind of bring those actual, actual numbers together that I, we have a bit more of a forgivingness, forgiving nature, you know, cause this is really cool. You're onto some very, very interesting stuff. Well, here. if I, if, if you, it. cause if you know that your average score is actually 79, not 75, then when you're out there and you're a couple over, you're like, that's kind of, I'm kind of playing my normal game. Not like, Oh shit. Why aren't I two under? Cause you're not <laughs> exactly <laughs> because yeah. golf, because golf is hard and we're not that good. Yeah, totally. So what you're bringing up is a super interesting point is that and you 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 used the word earlier you said aspirational yeah so i see myself as a player who within sort of the reality that i've constructed for myself and the one is like i like i don't cling to say fantasy of being a scratch because i am not going to put in the time I, I, I have a business that I'm running. I have other things that I balance in my life. If I wanted to be a scratch golfer, I th- you know, I'd have to be playing a lot more golf and practicing a lot more than I can. And, However, and by the way, it's not, it's not without, uh, it is a possibility though. Yeah. I mean, you could do it. If I wanted if to invest wanted the to, time, if I wanted to invest a, the time. Excuse me. It's like my brother calling me last year at 68 saying, I got to overhaul my game. I'm like, are you going to quit your job and move into Ledbetter's basement? (laughs) Because if you're not, you're not overhauling anything. Please continue. I'm listening. So so what's interesting, though, is that I still, there's still something that I want to move to. When I say I'm competitive, because I see it in myself, I see the game that I can play sometimes, that it would be possible to shoot 76 on a more frequent basis. Absolutely. Not that, not that that's the most important thing in the world, but that, you know, I see those possibilities. And I see those possibilities in games in which, and I think we all do this, is that when we find ourselves in, say, a flow state, or those days in which it's going well, or what we might call the zone, some people think it's almost like the golf gods have like taken pity on us in spring. You know, uh, Timmy or Howard hasn't had tried break hard. In a while. So we're going to sprinkle a little dust on you. And That's right. Here's nice. a few. Here's a few moments of clarity in a sea of chaos. Enjoy. Yeah, exactly. But the the thing is, is that when we're in that zone, it's actually showing us what we're really capable of. Yeah, our potential. What, what's really what's really possible. How ever is that we're human beings like i said and we're layered with these patterns of behavior uh that have followed us our whole lives whether you're you know 20 40 or 60 and it's those patterns that just keep coming back and inflicting themselves on us and we they trigger us 
and and it's how we become you know aware of those things and and deal with them that's why i'm that to me why it's so important for for us to be aware of like what am i paying attention to right now am i yeah. caught in a fantasy or in a story and 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 i can tell you <clears throat> even when well i don't want i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap up this segment in a segment even when things are going well we start telling ourselves a story you know one of the things i've committed to this year because i have a friend paul henrick he's been on the show former tour player blah 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 and i you know paul is like uh kind of like my golf you know my golf father if you will he takes the place of actually my actual father and i like to call him after my rounds or i traditionally did that and tell him the story of the day and i said to him at the start of the season i said i said palsy i'm not going to do that this year um as often because what i found myself doing is in the beginning of the round i was already thinking of what i would tell paul later got it totally and and, and i realized I was starting to create the post round story at various stages, sometimes right off the beginning. Uh, I started off, I, well, you know, you know what I mean? Like, oh, hmm, totally. Every golfer does it, or we all do it. Many do. <laughs> okay. So there's that. I, just, I wanted, because I know we're, we're going to do a little shorter today, probably longer than I said, but I, I really think that what we just did there is very informative, instructive for a lot of people. So, um, because the idea of being competitive, et cetera, is, you know, I'm, I'm very competitive, as you know, and I do spend the time and I do want to, you know, get down to a plus or a, a, you know, a solid zero. And so I take a lot of, you know, I, a lot of what I do goes into that, but I also want to win everything I enter. I just do. Um, and in a couple of weeks, I'm going to defend the club championship, senior geezer invitational. And then later in the summer, I've only, I, I finished second in the club championship. A few years ago, like, I guess 2018, when I finished or 27, whatever, I finished second in the club championship and second in the senior. Now, realistically, and I, and Paul would not want me to say this, I want to have both. I have this goal after Phil won the PGA. I said, oh, okay, yeah, I want to yeah. win. I want to win both. I want to win the senior and the junior. And I want to park because right the club champion parks next to the senior thing. And I'm going to park diagonally. I'm just going to park over both. <laughs> That's going to be my statement. I'm going to come into the golf course and park sideways over both um, parking spots. Now, realistically, there's five or six or seven guys that are in their 20s, 30s, and early 40s that I have, you know, I could beat them once. Yeah. But, but not, it, so realistically, can I win? Is it realistic that I can win that? Probably not. But my idea is why not try? Holy you know, cow. Yeah, I'm, I'm stronger than I've been in years. I've done more Brooke, Benny, Bama Lamb stuff in the last couple of months. You know, I, I'm, I'm faster. My club head speeds faster, etc. And so part of my journey, and I made it, my statement was last night, but the last week or so, I've been playing with a lot of the younger guys from the back tees. Back tees of Glen Karen are 67.50. The blue tees are 64.50. I know it's only a few hundred yards. But on three three holes, one hole on every nine, they're very different. Totally. And then I decided to, on men's night this season, just play the back tees. Great. And there's there's a, a there's a game amongst all the back tee guys. I'm the only, I'm older than everyone by twenty years, and a few guys in my age group like, what are you doing that? And I said because, come the club championship weekend. I don't want it to be the first time I played the golds in three months. I want it to be like, well, I play here all the time. Now, again, will that allow me to win it? No, probably not, if we're being honest. But I, it will allow me to do better than I would have had I not had this experience. Completely. And yeah, you know, I, I probably will shoot a little higher, you know, not necessarily, but maybe, because it is longer. But I... I, you know, I played uh, with uh, a couple of guys that really hit it far from our course uh, a Friday, a week ago Friday, and I shot 75 from the tips. Now it was a very calm day, and I bogeyed the last hole, last two holes to do it again. Mm. You know, I don't normally do that. So I shot 75, but, you know, it could have easily just as been even par. Again, two or three shots on either side of my average score. The point of it is, though, is why not? You know, why not put myself 
in that position, even though my ego, I maybe not shoot as low on men's night, but I, I say I made the decision, I don't care. I don't care about men's night as much as I care about having the experience of having to hit a five iron on a par three versus a seven iron and having to, you know, manage my way around those really difficult holes. Yeah. I would like you to comment, and then I'm going to give you a great example of how to use, you know, Decade and how to use Tim and how to use Howard to manage yourself around a hole. Please comment, and then I will continue. Well, I, I love that. And the, the thing is, is that you could, so the ego is always scratching and clawing going, no, you don't want to do that. Now, what, really? if you, what if you shoot a big score? Exactly. Everyone's going to look at you and all that. And so the ego is always battling us like that. But I love the presence of mind because you you used the word context uh, last week, I think. And that's a, a, a great one to look at is that so in the context of what I'm doing in my golf and what I aspire and what I'm doing, shooting the numbers doesn't really matter that much. It's mm -hmm. about the experience and it just makes a ton of sense that if you're playing back tees, you're going to be more stress on your game. You're going to be called upon to hit more difficult shots, longer shots. Yeah. You're going to be dealing with more dispersion, all of that kind of stuff. So the quality of your game, it's like, if you want to get, you know, if you want to get stronger, you got to do a more vigorous workout. That's right. In order to become a better golfer, you have to play a more vigorous game. So by the back tees. So I love what you're, um, I love this approach. And you'll and like, it'll, you'll pre go ahead. No, and it'll, it'll give you more, um, give you a, a better opportunity when you play against the kids in the club C, not that that's the be all and end all. Well, I, I mean, it isn't, but like, again, you know, I'm kind of, you know, my, my joke with Paul and the rest of my team is I want to win both of them. And the other thing it will do is that by the time the, the senior club championship comes in like three weeks, I will have played probably five or six rounds from back there. And then going to the blues, totally. will feel like I'm going to the whites. Exactly. Because, and I, the, what I was going to interrupt you by saying, at our age, at 61 and 65 or four, I don't know how many more years I'm going to be able to, how old are you? 61. 68 or 70? What are you? 64. You're 64. Yes. But you look great. Um, I don't know how many more years I'll be able to generate the club head speed that I am. Like, yep. if, if it turns out that I have a Bernard Langer club championship, like I'm the low old guy, I'm fine with that too. I just, I want to do the best I can and give myself the best opportunity, even though I'm 61. So I'm going to tell you about a hole from last night, uh, men's night. I think I, uh, again, I didn't have a great front nine. I, 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 I track it so much now. I had three holes in a row where I made bogey, which almost never happens in a round of golf with me. So I shot five over par, 77 from the tips. But I, I bogeyed three in a row, which was odd. And I also made a sloppy bogey on the 17th hole because I also shot 40, 37. So I sort of got myself around the golf course, mostly around par. But one of the holes, that, so I picked out three holes, one each nine that I have to be careful with. And one of them is the second hole, which would have been my 11th hole of the day. So at that point in the round, I'm four over par. It's 471 yards, par four. Now from the blue tees, I can... I can hit it over the bunkers. It's two scotch block, if you know Glenn Karen. Downwind, I can easily hit it over. Very often, I've hit driver eight iron on. From the blue tees, it's 450. But if you can cut the dog leg, which I can easily do from the blues, it plays a lot shorter. Driver eight iron from the rough, driver nine iron, but not from the golds. I can't <laughs> go anywhere near those bunkers because the bunkers, those three bunkers, are like getting into a water hazard. Yep. My plan has been to play it like a par five. So last night I hit my drive, uh, I hit good, made good contact, but I kind of wiped it a bit far to the right of those bunkers. And I had 200 and let's say 225 to the flag, maybe 215 ish to the pin. I'm sorry, to the front of the green, but there's bunkers at around 210. Oh, yeah. There's bunkers everywhere up there. And I had my three wood out in my hand. I thought, you know, if I, kill this i can get it to the green but if i don't i'm going to be in one of those bunkers and now i'm bringing double bogey and i remember howard i said it's a par five so i laid up i laid up with a seven iron 
and I had 65 ish yards to the green, hit it to about nine feet. Now it's a great story because I made the putt, but I made it and I fist pumped. Like I didn't make any birdies yesterday, which is also again, a bit unusual shot 77, no birdies, but I felt like that was a birdie. Totally. I felt that four on that hole was like, I, I had a plan. My ego didn't get in the way. Oh, I should be able to hit the screen in two. Yeah, maybe. But I just stuck to my idea that if I made five on the hole, that it would be fine. Totally. That making six, I wanted to make sure that wasn't part of it. So what I did, and again, um, you know, STDs, swing thought, devotees. <laughs> I, I think that's an instructive lesson for all of us in terms of, you know, there's holes on every course you play that don't fit your eye that dog leg away you don't like, have a carry you're not comfortable with, have bunkers you don't want to be in. And it's, you know, we've been preaching this for a long time. It's perfectly fine to play them your own way. Because I'll tell you what, that four gave me a nice little boost. You know, I went around the rest of that night and made one bogey and eight pars from 3,400 yards. It was really not a big deal. So, you know, I, I was proud of the fact that I had had this plan and in, I didn't get pulled into the ego of the moment. And yeah, it was nice I made four, but I would have been perfectly, you know, sanguine making bogey there because, you know, I can tell you that bogey on that hole on men's night, it's a par. You know, it's the number one, uh, one or two handicap on that side for a reason. Because most no. guys who played last night outside of the most excellent of young golfers would make would make a, a bogey on that hole. Mm -hmm. Well, what I uh, really like about that is, again, in, in the context of what you're playing, you know, a bogey would be fine on that hole because there's not, you're not, you're not giving up any strokes to, no. to the field at all. But it's also the, when you couple that with intention, it kind of takes us to a higher level, I think, of, of, of awareness and, and it takes our performance to a higher level as well, because there, you know, consider that if, if you think that you have to absolutely stripe nut this three wood to get it there, yeah. and then the possible consequences of if, if you don't, well, if, you know, you played this game enough, you know that you're highly likely to be in, have some tension. And so that shot becomes even more difficult when there's so much kind of weighing on it and the consequences of not pulling it off. Yeah, your edginess so, goes up for sure. Exactly. So when you have an intention that, okay, if I bogey's going to be my personal par here, well, everything just kind of just settles down. Mm -hmm. And you can make an aggressive swing to a conservative target. Then you can free wheel your, your wedge. Got, you know, that's, that all just makes so much sense. And just speaking personally, I do that at Blue Springs as well. When I'm playing from the gold, number eight, and uh, I play as a one of the as toughest. Par five. By the way, number eight on that goddamn golf course is ridiculous. It yeah, really totally. is. It should be a par five for most players. But from the golds, especially, that's a yep. really tough hole. Number ten, I don't care. I played from the greens. That's a no. personal gonna, par. I, number it's ten a, from the kids' tees, little red tees, is still a tough hole. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I guess what we're saying here, folks, is when you kind of put things in perspective particularly around your own abilities and what the golf course providing you that day, then the game can be a lot easier again. And that's why I love this idea of what we've been talking about the last month or so around context expectations. Yeah. Big ones. And it just makes golf uh, easier and you can, you can play better and yeah, more fun too. Well, and <clears throat> because, you know, I, I think in our very first episode, six years ago, I said to you, I gave you the example of my older brother, you know, taking out three wood on a par five, yeah. you know, he's two forty five away and there's trouble everywhere and trees and bunkers and waters in there. And I remember saying, I mean, if I give you a seven iron and I'll put a seven iron in your hand, you're a good enough golfer. You'll make a nice swing. In fact, you know, people have always had a lot of our listeners had this experience where you're laying up on a par five. It's the best swing you make all day because you're out in the field, but that swing feels like a range swing. Because you've got all this room and seven iron in your hand and it feels comfortable and oh, lo and behold, your swing frees up. But that same shot with the three wood, as you said, you know, you never know which, which one of that shotgun blast is coming. But with high 
you know, difficulty and high consequences comes tension and the outcome is the low healer, the hook left, the skanky topped one that goes into the, there's a bunker about 40 yards from both, both sides of the fairway where I would have maybe mishit my three wood that would have made it difficult for me to make bogey. Where I hit it made bogey uh, um, a certainty. Because I had, you know, from 60 yards, I'm not saying I can always hit it nine feet because it was a good shot. It was a nice shot. But again, it goes to your point about my tension level was so low because I've got a lob wedge in my hand and I only need to hit it 65 yards. I don't even know if it was that far. And I thought, well, worst comes to worst, I can hit this to 30 feet and two putt it. And and that's what I'm saying about tension level. Yeah, and this is... You're just and trying this, to imagine, I was going to say, man, what Doolin would say is you're just trying to manage your state. Yeah, exactly. And, and it starts with the decisions that you make. Yes. And so many of the decisions that, that many golfers make, heck, I make a lot of the time, they, they just increase my level of tension and they decrease my margin for error. And one of the things that is such a game changer for golfers when they finally start to get this thing called course management. Yeah. And that is you hit it in the trees nine times out of 10. What's the smartest shot back into the fairway. You just chip it out. You're going to leave yourself a wedge or something as opposed to trying to hit that hero shot, which almost invariably because of what we just talked about, the tension that you have and you start to hit some awful shot like, Jordan Spieth did in the masters makes a triple. I mean, Mm -hmm. because the, the odds, again, if you get back to the, to the numbers part of this deal, you know, if you're, you're in the rough, you got some trees to deal with, you got some, you know, a bunker ahead of you, you got some junk left, you got water, whatnot. When you're feeling tension and you really need this, it's like, I need this to work out. Yeah. You're lowering your ability to do it because the numbers are going to work against you. I, a nice thing that I tell a lot of people is, is that before you hit a shot, could you stand there and say, yeah, eight, nine times out of 10, I can hit this. Mm-hmm. If you don't have that, if that equation doesn't ring true for you, well then the, <laughs> it's, you should try another shot until you get you know, to that eight to nine, 10 out of eight to nine out of 10, you can pull this off. You know, one of the things I like, too, is every once in a while, I'll think of an old golf cliche and I'll think, oh, you know, in the context of our show now and all the information that we've been able to, uh, you know, share with the audience and and information that's been shared with us, you know, the old uh, golf cliche, if you're going to lay up, lay up. You know, that's another thing people, you know, like I, the the shot I chose on the second hole of this 470 yard par four, the shot I chose was so comfortable for me that no matter what I did with it, it was going to be out there somewhere. And, and again, that's why it's such an easy swing to make because to your point, I can make that shot 98 times out of 100. I'm so confident hitting a seven iron 165. I'm just looking down at my notes. That's what it was. I laid up and I had, I actually had my, I have my, my notes here from the game. I, I was actually 74 four yards from the flag when I hit the third shot. But the point is the numbers of times, blah, blah, blah. So many times guys will go to lay up in a par five and they'll hit it into the bunker that they're trying to lay up into. And you're like, what are you doing? How are you? Well, I and I say that to myself, I'm like, what, are, what is going on? <laughs> well, I think sometimes people are just getting greedy. Yeah, I'm gonna lay up, but yeah. I wanna leave myself. As to, close as I can. Yeah, and 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 what is really the stupidest shot in golf is to lay up into a hazard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is the stupidest shot. And 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 again, I play with other people and, and enjoy the, the company, but I often will just scratch my head, even with better players. Like, you know, I played with a, friend, a mutual friend of ours. Um, I don't wanna out him but he's a good guy played with him a couple of days ago and at, oh no, no, it wasn't him. It was another guy I played with. He's a good player. I played with him yesterday and there was a couple of occasions. It wasn't our friend, although he's got a, he's a crazy good golfer, but I, this guy I played with yesterday, he's a good player. And a couple of times he hit shots. I'm like, you just walk me through what, what yeah, was yeah, that? Yeah. Where did, where do you think you were supposed to hit that? Cause you're so far into the shit where there's just so much room over here. <laughs> Exactly. I just, I just don't understand. But a lot of it is, is poor 
thought processes slash aiming. We just, uh, my, my, I'm going to, we're going to wrap up. I'll tell you my last, my only takeaway, you know, in the, what we're working on segment is hmm. for me, it's the basics all the time. And one of the fundamentals that will make a huge difference this weekend, just get really curious, have someone stand behind you and work on your aiming. When I finished yesterday, I went to the range for 10 minutes. And <clears throat> one of our friends, Nick Trachilio, was there, not in a teaching capacity because that doesn't come back till Friday. He just finished his <laughs> round. He said hi to me. And I, we, he commented on, he saw me make a few swings. He goes, wow, this looks so much different. It looks so good since we first met each other five years ago. But he said, I only have one thing to say. I think you're aimed, which is great. He says, I think you're aimed further left than you think you are. Because he said, I was hitting a few shots left. And he said, I, they were well hit. But they were left where I, and he said, which is a good problem to have because most yeah. people aim too far right. But I can just tell you, this weekend, get curious about where you're aiming. And then to trick yourself, once you aim correctly, don't look back at the target. Just keep your head down, make a swing, and then look up. Because what, what screws people up the most, I find, is I'll put them in the proper alignment. Then they'll look up and their head moves. And now they think they can't believe where they're aimed, so they try and maneuver the swing but if you can put a, a, a an intermediate target down or have a friend look behind you once he says you're aimed correctly don't look again just hit the shot absolutely and and there's a good reason for that and i'll be brief it's called parallax distortion because obviously you... <laughs> also a new movie from disney this spring it's parallax distortion and actually, it's a foot pedal for rock guitar players. <laughs> you know what? I've never loved you more than I have right now. <laughs> Parallax Distortion. Also the name of Tim's punk band. <laughs> exactly. So the way it works is, so when you stand behind the ball and you get your alignment, you're looking straight down the target line. Yeah. But if you are looking, what happens is you're looking at an angle. So there's distortion right there. So yeah, Because your eyes are triangulating it. Exactly. So... That's why so many golfers, uh, they particularly do that in, in putting. That's yes. why I would, that's why I always, I rarely take a practice swing when I putt, but if I do, it's going to be from behind the ball, looking down the line. Yeah. And then it's like, you know, what's that intermediate target? And you get the club there. And then it's like, off we, you know, off we go. Um, I'm not sure if you teach this in your putting seminars, but I can tell you as, as, as goes putting, as goes your full swing. And here's the little life hack or golf hack for you. Once you're comfortable with what I described, when you're putting and when you're looking at your target, and I, I know we're doing this on a, a video, but here's, if, you, if you're not, if you're just listening to it, what you want to do is turn your head with your right ear, if you're right-handed, with your right ear going to the ground. So basically you're turning your head 90 degrees as opposed to your head coming up and both eyes looking down the target line. Exactly. You watch Nicholas, you watch Tiger. They totally. had this look down the target where they're sort of looking at it sideways. So just, and, and it's really crucial in putting because if you've got yourself lined up and then you pop your head up and then have it sort of both eyes looking because of the parallax distortion. Um, just turn your head 90 degrees, put your, it'll just feel like your right ear is going to the ground. Okay. Love that. Love that. Um, love that. Love you. Love, uh, Taylor made of course. And, uh, while hey. the music's playing, tell everyone, uh, you tell everyone about your uh, stuff and then I'll do the uh, sponsor stuff and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. Yeah. So, um, June the 22nd, uh, I'm starting a, uh, an online course. Uh, it's six weeks. It's called uh, Quiet Mind, um, putting, how to lower your score without changing your stroke. Does that sound familiar? And so that's, uh, so Do go I to my website. for coming up with that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, check out my website, O'ConnorGolf.ca for that. And uh, just announcing today as well that um, putting on uh, a Quiet Mind uh, short game clinic at Rattlesnake Point on uh, June the 23rd that I'm doing with uh, Nate Robinson, the director of golf there. So, uh, so check out my website for some of the details on those events. Um, check out jwapparelinc.com. Uh, both of us wearing uh, the uh, fine, uh, the finery from uh, uh, some of his uh, the lines he reps. 
And of course, anytime you see us, you'll see us using TaylorMade's finest products. The uh, the Sim 2 drivers are available and the irons as well. Um, older brother David just got fit for some TaylorMade stuff. You can too. Find out more at TaylorMade.ca or TaylorMadeGolf.ca. And uh, coming soon, the U.S. Open uh, prize giveaway. That's right. I was corresponding with our buddy Nick at uh, TaylorMade, and we've uh, set up some more giveaways for the uh, U.S. Open, another major giveaway from Swing Thoughts. Uh, and, of course, HumbleAndFredRadio.com. You can see me. Can me. Uh, happy golfing, everybody. Take care. Have fun. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.